Aren't you glad to be in the Lord's house tonight? Amen. Would you stand with us as we lift our voices, turn our hearts to our Heavenly Father tonight? When he rolls up the sleeve, he just put on the ritz, our God is an awesome God. There was thunder in his footsteps and lightning in his fist, our God is an awesome when he kicked him out of Eden It wasn't for no reason that he shed his blood His return is very soon And so you better be believing That our God is an awesome God Our God is an awesome God He reigns from heaven up With his own power and love Our God is an awesome God Our God is an awesome God He Darkness and created the light. Our God is an awesome God. The judgment wrath poured out a song. The mercy and grace he gave us such a call. That we have not too quickly forgotten. church.
All righty. Thank you, Brother Sam and Dan, uh, for leading us in worship and just reminding us that we do serve an awesome God. And may we not forget about Calvary and the cross and all that all that Jesus did for us. And so, so again, thank you, Sam, and uh, we're blessed to have gifted musicians and uh, singers to lead us in worship, and we're just grateful. So let's go, Lord, in prayer and just ask that he would speak to us tonight uh, from his word. So let's just pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we just bow before you. You are a great God. You're an awesome God, as we just sang about. Just so awesome, and as we think about Calvary and all that you did for us, that you would shed your blood for us so that we might have eternal life. That we might be able to have the righteousness of God. That we might be able to be in right standing with God due to your grace and mercy. Lord, we just say thank you tonight. We can't say thank you enough for eternal life. We can't say thank you enough for being part of the body of Christ and being part of your church and being part of the community of Christ followers here at Bethsaida. And Lord, we just pray you would um, just be with us as a body, move and work in our lives, move and work in your church here, move and work in your church ultimately in this nation and ultimately around this world. Lord, we do pray for our nation. Lord, may you send revival to the churches, to our church, so that we might be a catalyst to help turn this country back to you. Because this country is running pretty much 180 degrees opposite of you, God. So, Lord, help us to walk in step with your will. Help us to know your will. And, Lord, we ask that you would just speak to us from your word and remind us of things that we need to be reminded of tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. All righty, so we are in this series of... Uh, Fight the good fight, and tonight we want to talk about remind the disciples, remind the disciples. Last week we looked at, uh, two weeks ago we looked at the picture of the disciple of Christ, and we looked at how you can have a growing relationship with Christ, and how you're to be like a, a devoted soldier, a disciplined athlete, or a diligent and hardworking farmer. Uh, and if you do need outlines, you got one, some in the front, some in the back, and if you're online, you can download that one also. Uh, last week, we looked at remember Jesus, first two words of the text, remember Jesus in verse 8, and how he is an example of faithfulness to all of us because he's our risen Savior, he's our Messiah, he's Lord and God, and because of Christ, our salvation is secure, and we can trust him. He's faithful, and we can trust his word, his gospel, his promise, and his nature. And so tonight, we're going to be in the next few verses, verses 14 through 19, and uh, we really get the title from, the, again, the first two words of the, the text there. He says, remind them, in verse 14, of these things and charge them before God not to fight about words. This is useless and leads to the ruin of those who listen. Be diligent to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who doesn't need to be ashamed, correctly teaching the word of truth. Avoid irreverent and empty speech, since those who engage in it will produce even more godlessness, and their teaching will spread like gangrene. Hymenaeus and Philetus are among them. They have departed from the truth, saying that the resurrection has already taken place and are ruining the faith of some. Nevertheless, God's Solid foundation stands firm, bearing this inscription. The Lord knows those who are His, 
And let everyone who calls on the name of the Lord to turn away or depart from wickedness. And so what we want to talk about tonight, the goal is this, is for us to understand as Christ followers, Christ followers should use the Bible to make progress in godliness. We as Christ followers, those who have given our lives to Christ, we should use the Word of God, we should use the Bible to make progress in godliness. So tonight I just want to give you three keys uh, for a few minutes and look at these three keys and how we're to use the Bible and make progress as a godly disciple. I say remind the disciple. I say why? Because uh, we're all disciples if you've given your life to Christ. A disciple is a follower, a learner of Jesus Christ. Okay? And so Timothy was a disciple, remember, of Paul. He basically been serving. Paul had discipled him. They'd been serving in ministry probably anywhere from about 17 to maybe 20 years. They'd known one another. And so, he again, here he's given Timothy, uh, who, again, probably when this was written to him, is maybe in his mid-30s, uh, and he was pastoring the church at Ephesus, and he gives him some keys here. Number one uh, key that I think we should uh, be reminded of is diligently study the word now verse 14 he says remind them of these things now what were these things i think if you go back to verse 1 in chapter 2 he says you therefore my son be what strong in the grace that is in christ jesus and what you've heard from me uh in the presence of many witnesses he what he says commit these to faithful men who will be able to teach others. He said, man, you need to commit these teachings, encourage them, remind them, and then I think he's also remind them of those faithful sayings in verses 11 through 13. If we died with him, we will also live with him. If we endure, we will reign with him. If you deny him, we'll deny you. Okay? But no matter what, God's faithful. And I think he's, Paul's saying, hey, remind them of these things. Now look what he says. He reminds them of these things, and he says, and what? This is, not a, this is not a light charge here. He says what? Charge them before who? Before God. Not to be fighting about words, but to be about the word of God. And see, what was happening back then, what happens many times, uh, people get to fighting about words, get to fighting about false teaching, and this is what's going on at this time, just like it's going on today. And they were fighting about the use of words, but you and I need to diligently study the Word, immerse ourselves in the Word. And he says, all right, be diligent to do what? To present yourself to who? Your wife? God. Because who are we going to be accountable of before? God. So he's saying, man, you need, he's given this charge. He's saying, man, you need to charge your brothers. You need to charge those you've been pouring into. Remind them of these things that, hey, you present yourself to God as what? An inspection. He's basically saying you need to present your life before God. You need to present your, you're going to present your family before God. You, you need to even present your marriage before God if you're married. And say, hey, be diligent to present yourself and everything that you do before God because we will be accountable to God one day. He says, all right, present yourself as what? One approved. What does that mean? Man, you, you, you've you been passing the test. You, you're passing the scrutiny. You've been trying to diligently study the Word. You've been trying to diligently walk a godly lifestyle is what he's saying. He says we're to present ourselves to God as one approved, a worker who doesn't need to be ashamed. See, we're not to be ashamed of Christ, and we're not to be ashamed of his word. The question is, will you be ashamed when you come before God because you didn't spend a whole lot of time in God's word? I think Paul's saying, Timothy, hey, don't be ashamed. Be that diligent worker now so that when you do come face to face before God, he'll say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. You, you, you studied the word. You were faithful the way I called you because you heeded the command here. And Paul wanted Timothy to do this, but he wants us to do this here. He said, man, I want you to make every effort, okay, to do what? To what? Correctly 
teaching the word, or uh, King James says, rightly dividing the word of truth. You say, man, you need to be able to get in the word, you need to be able to work hard in the word, and it, it, literally this word here, uh, correctly teaching the word, it, it, it's a word that has intensity, it's saying, man, it's, it's a picture of hard work, you're getting in there, working in the word. Now, that word correctly teaching conveys the notion of cutting straight. Now, the word, the Greek word there, we get uh, two words from in English, orthodontist and orthodoxy. Now, what does the orthodontist do? They realign your teeth and hopefully make them straight. What is orthodoxy? It's a belief that rightly aligns with Scripture and the historic Christian faith. See, this word was a picture. This word was also a picture. Uh, at that time, they would use this word to picture three pictures back then. Number one, it would be used in farming. Say, hey, that, that brother, he made a straight furrow. Or that, that person that worked with stone and brick, they had a straight row of bricks there. Or the Romans really knew how to make roads. And God used it, if you don't realize, he used it to advance the gospel. But they also knew how to make straight roads. And so it was a picture many times, this word saying, hey, be straight. Get in the word, rightly divide the word. Take the word seriously. Get in and know what the truth is. Know straight what God says. He's saying, don't, just don't handle the word lightly. See, unfortunately, <laughs> many people just think the Bible's a footnote. I'm sure you've heard preachers do this. They read one verse and they're departed and never came back to this. And we have people in our churches sitting in our chairs and pews all over the land and they got a Bible after they walked an aisle and made a decision, were baptized and haven't opened up this Bible in who knows how long. Because it's sitting on the coffee table, it's sitting in the bookshelf, it's a brand new Bible. Looks really nice. Has crisp pages. It's not worn out. Doesn't have one highlight in it. And no notes. And Paul says, hey, you and I need to get in God's word. We need to read God's word. We need to memorize God's word. We need to journal what God is teaching in his, his word. We need to meditate on the truth of God's word. So that's hard work. That's what the word means. Diligent. Diligently. Hard work. He just gave us the picture of a disciple in verses 1 through 7. And those three there, soldier, athlete, farmer, they're not lazy people. And if you're going to be a disciple and a growing disciple of Christ, you're going to strive to live godly lives, you have to spend time in God's Word. You want to see revival? I didn't plan on it. It just hit me. This kind of ties in what I preached on Sunday. Uh, but if you want to hunger and thirst for righteousness, you've got to get into God's Word. You know, you want to see God do something in your life? Get in God's Word. Jim Elliott, you may know the missionary who was martyred in the jungles of Ecuador, when he was a student at Wheaton, he wrote in his diary, he said, uh, my grades came through this week and they were, as expected, lower than last semester. He said, however, I love what he said, I, I make no apologies. Admit I've let them drag a bit for the study of the Bible in which I seek the degree, he says, A-U-G. What does that mean? Approved unto God. 
And he said, my grades with God were more important than my grades at Wheaton College. See, one day we'll stand before God and we'll be accountable for how we've dealt with his word. And I think that's why Paul is telling Timothy this and he's telling us this. Hey, we need to diligently study his word. I don't care how old you are. I don't care how many times you read the Bible. There's always something there for you because why? Because when you open up the word of God, God will speak to you. And he can give you that fresh manna that you need every single day. Number two, second key. Avoid false teaching. The reason you need to be in the word is so you can avoid the false teaching. And uh, there's false teachers, there's false teaching back then, it was very rampant, just like it is today. He actually gives six reasons for avoiding and opposing all this false teaching. And I'm just going to run through, they're just right there in the text, there's nothing on the outline. But basically saying avoid these false teachers, because in verse 14 it says, man, it leads to the ruin of those who listen. You lead to false teachers, and if you listen to them, man, they're going to mess you up. Even if you're a Christ follower. Your name's written in the Lamb's Book of Life. We're going to see a little bit further once we get to chapter 4. Many people, it says in the end, just want to hear, you know, they just want to get their ears tickled. And again, as I've said, my God is, my job is to exegete and rightly divide and preach the word. not give you lollipops that make you feel good. If you want that, go to Dr. Phil. Can God encourage you, strengthen you? Yes, all through the Word. But my job is to preach the Word. God's job is to save souls. God's job is to to draw us closer to him. And if we get in his word, then you'll be able to go, they don't smell right. That teaching is, that's not right. And so you need to, that's why you need to be in the word. Number two, it, verse 15 says, it brings shame on the teacher. Man, if you're not, diligent in the word and you're teaching false it's going to bring shame on you and if you don't spend time in god's word and you fall into this this false teaching there's going to be that shame on you verse 16 it talks about how it leads to ungodliness because you start chasing all this irreverent and empty speech and it will produce what godlessness and then it will do what? Verse 17. Once that stuff gets in you, it spreads like what? Gangrene. It spreads like cancer. And what's amazing is, uh, Paul doesn't mix any words here. He didn't say, well, there, there were some people spreading some false teaching. It says, Hymenaeus and Philetus those two dudes that are in the church, they're spreading junk. Now, he would have he gotten kicked off Twitter and Facebook for that. <laughs> but he called a spade a spade. And he says, because of this, he says, because of them, it's doing what? It's leading to the ruin of the faith of some. Because they were listening to the, the false teachers, man, it was ruining their faith because I'm sure they were like, what do we believe? What, where do I stand? I'm not rooted in the Word. Do I listen to Him? Do I, do, do I listen to, to another preacher or what? And the reason is, is because many times those false teachers do not belong to the Lord. Now, it was rampant back then. It's rampant back today. Uh, now, what were they teaching? They were teaching, did you, 
you get this? He says, hey, they're teaching that the resurrection has already taken place. What, what does that mean? That the second coming of Jesus had already come. So just get that in your mind. If Jesus had already come, well, what's the reason to be in church? <laughs> what's the reason for the gospel? So you can just imagine most of these people, first generation Christ followers, more than likely, got saved out of paganism. Jesus radically saved them. They were getting some teaching, and Paul's moved on, and then these false teachers come in, and they're like, you can just imagine what was going on swirling in their minds. Like, well, I thought Jesus was coming, you know. And was, I'm sure some of them were like, threw up their hands and maybe walked out the door, never to come back. Do we have that today? Yeah. Actually, I don't know. I'm I haven't decided yet. Lord, oh God. But it may start on Wednesday night, and I may just take this series like baloney and sh chop it and talk about some of the false teaching we got going on right now. But, I mean, you got Jehovah's Witnesses. you got Mormons. you got cults. you got uh, CRT. you got social justice. you got liberation theology that's all up in all of our evangelical churches it's about uh, to implode uh, our Southern Baptist Convention so don't say it's not around that's why you need to be in the word so when you hear somebody sling that junk you can say that that doesn't line up with the word of God they're not rightly dividing the word they're not correctly handling the word of god I, I, i'm not going to chase that rabbit but i read a quote by one of these professors at mercer about make you want to throw up basically saying it was okay of god you know part of god and worshiping god is part of you know black lives matter and and all these other activist groups you know that that's part of i was thinking where in a Sam Hill you get that in the Word of God? I have no idea. Basically because they don't know the Lord. They've gone to school and have degrees, but don't know the author of the Bible. So you've got to understand, there's a lot of false teaching all over the place. And because of that, Study the word, and then third key is just very simple, guard your heart. Guard your heart. Now, it says here, Nevertheless, God's salvation, uh, solid foundation stands firm, bearing this inscription, The Lord knows those who are his. And he says, Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord is to what? Depart, turn away, from wickedness and iniquity. And so, that's, he's talking to us, he's talking to Timothy, he's talking to Christ followers. He's saying, as Psalm 34, 14 says, man, we need to turn away from evil, do what is good, seek peace, and pursue it. He's saying, man, there is false teachers out there, and you need to guard your heart. Because I'm telling you, some of those, some of these guys, have charisma they speak very well they sound like they're what they're talking about is right and seem like a very good person but many of them have bought into a deception and so be very careful who you listen to Again, you need to determine, and I've said this before, whatever I'm preaching, well, whoever, whoever you're listening to preaching and teaching, you better make sure what they're saying correctly lines up with the Word of God. Now, some things we may disagree on, and they're not, you're like, hey, I disagree on, you know, uh, the second coming and the rapture and some of the, those things, you know, 
You may say, hey, he's coming to the first of tribulation. I'm coming. Those are, those are not, those are minor things. But if what they're taking is pulling it out of context and making it say something that it does not say, which happens all the time, you need to guard your heart from those people. That's why Proverbs 4.23 says, guard your heart with what? All diligence, for out of it what spring the issues of life. If you don't guard your heart and you accept false teaching, it's going to greatly affect how you live. So let me just share this one last illustration. There was a young man, he studied violin under a world-renowned master, and he had his first big recital, and he goes to play the violin, and every number, the, you know, the people in the, the crowd were, you know, clapping and encouraging him. But even through the recital, he still seemed to be just a little bit uh, unhappy, even though he kept playing and doing the best he could, and and at the end, when he finally finished, uh, there was an elderly man in the balcony. And finally, the elderly man in the balcony smiled and just kind of gave him a, you know, a nod of, of approval. And all of a sudden, this young man, he was smiling because he realized he had played to the approval of his master. Because that elderly man had trained him and how to play the violin. See, we are to live for the approval of one. And that's very difficult at times. We only live for the approval of God. That's why he says here in the text, present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who doesn't need to be ashamed. Our culture is all concerned about what everybody else thinks. And to be honest with you, we're kind of wired that way. We're, you know, what do you think? You know, we're, what do you think? You know, but ultimately we can't live for the approval of all these people. If you do, they will distract you from the most important thing, and that's Christ. And so you and I have got to understand, one day we'll come before him, and we're only living for the approval of one. And that's why I think one reason we should get in the Word. Your Bible should be falling apart little or highlights and notes and look like it's been used. See, the thing is, are you a skilled craftsman? No, I'm not a skilled craftsman. No, I, I'm not either. <laughs> if you ask me to build you something tomorrow, don't come to me. I'm not the one to do it. <laughs> but I think God wants us all to learn how to be craftsman in his word now, I'm not saying perfect I'm not saying you have to have a theological degree some of the most godly men have a 6th grade education <laughs> but they've read God's word and they've digested it and it's become part of them see the misuse of the Bible will lead to ruin No use of the Bible will lead to a carnal life. The use of God's word in your life will lead to godliness. And so I think that's what Paul is calling us to. Hey, we just need to get back to the word. Again, that's not a popular sermon, but it's pretty simple. And that's where we got to get back to. We want to know how to live for Christ. Get in the Word. We don't want to know what Christ wants us to do. Get in His Word. You want to see God move in your family? Get in His Word. You want to see revival? Get in His Word. So let me give you some prayer requests tonight uh, for you online and here in person. Uh, number one, if you don't know, pray uh, for Timberview High School in Arlington, Texas. 
Jenton heard they had a school shooting there. Uh, students, parents, and teachers pray for them. The last I heard, there was four victims, but I haven't heard if anybody has died from that. Has anybody heard anything else other than that? Hadn't heard any deaths, just one critical, but four, four fatalities. I think three students and one teacher is what I heard. So, do what? Four injuries, sorry. Four injuries, yes. Sorry. Uh, number two, pray for trunk or treat. It would be October 30th. Pray for workers. Um, and pray we'll touch many uh, families uh, with our love for Christ and our, and our service to them. So, let's pray for that. Well, I didn't put that on there, but pray for good weather that day. Because if it rains, we won't be able to do it. Okay? Uh, again, pray for our churches to wake up to the seriousness of the day and ask God uh, and ask and pray for God to move. Then also pray that God would pour out on our churches a spirit of repentance, um, that God would move in our, in our hearts and lives. Number five, I um, want to go ahead and just uh, let you know we'll be doing this. will be another prayer night of prayer walking like we did uh, before the grand reopening. We're going to do one on October 27th because we figured that would be the best time to do it. That will be right before the trunk or treat. And so we'll do some of the same things. We'll go and pray over the whole campus, um, pray over rooms and life group and everything. Uh, so we'll be doing that on October 27th. You'll, we'll tell you more about that and what we'll be doing on that night. Uh, number six. Uh, pray for the nominating committee as we look at nominating a student search committee and then pray for uh, the student pastor that God has for our church. And then number seven, uh, pray for the Southern Baptist and its future. I don't really have a time to go into it. If you want to talk to me about it, but it isn't. Um, it's imploding. Uh, but I've been praying and some of us have been praying that God would expose the corruption and maybe that's part of what it is. But um, but just pray. Um, there's just a lot of stuff going on that I, I, don't, I don't support and I don't think you would support either. Um, so, so just pray as we, um, in the future, as we look as far as what we give as a church, uh, as far as the national convention, uh, as far as the state and the local, yes, we we're going to support them. But the national convention, there's a lot of, there's just not a lot of accountability and transparency there. And since we're a small little church in Georgia, uh, they only listen when we do one thing. Stop sending money. That's the only time they'll listen. So, so but do pray. Pray that uh, God will move and work in our uh churches but most and also in our convention so all right so we're going to have some time to pray you online hope you'll join us on sunday as we'll be looking at the merciful attitude um again a powerful powerful another uh beatitude that we'll be looking at so hope y'all have a great night praying online and uh, we'll see y'all on sunday and then everybody in here we can just break into as many groups you want to break in two three four